is uh, Vera Zolder. Uh, Dr. Zolder has recently returned to New York and joined the uh, liberal studies faculty senior lecturer uh, from Purdue University. She is a sociologist whose many interests include socioeconomic cultural considerations. She has written a lot and has and will, I trust, continue to offer courses here on the avant-garde on what she calls the tradition of the new, on the analysis of modern cultural institutions such as museums, on the cultural policy of different nations, and on differing patterns of patrons. It's a great pleasure to uh, introduce your result. I, I think I'll start first by saying a few things that I'm not going to be talking about as a committee that I should, and maybe questions that will come up in discussion afterwards about what you want to do and what this is. For one thing, as a sociologist, although I could have, I'm not doing any analyses of specific works of art. Um, it can be done, I have done some of it, but in the time of all of it, that won't be possible, but I will refer to a number of works which I think are well known. Secondly, um, I, what my remarks will be mostly confined to what we call in modern Western society fine art, and not all kinds of art. I will occasionally refer to it in different kinds of art, but that is not what I'm going to be focusing on right now. And thirdly, um, the topic that perhaps I shouldn't talk about in connection with what is art for, is only 13 years I walked into this room, is art for politics, which we have, which I hope will come up in, in questions. Um, having left out all of these important things, what is included? Well, it's, it's obviously a very broad question what it's art for and can be handled in many ways. So many ways, ranging from routine to very unexpected ways. Uh, some people might not even consider it a valid question, since, after all, the very concept art is admittedly a culture by a term tied mainly to Western society, roughly since about the Renaissance. In fact, even when Giorgio Vasari wrote his book on the lives of the artists, he used the term the most excellent painters and sculptors, he used the, the artists, and as Ellen uh, pointed out, this is a term which came into general use somewhat later. In other words, the meaning of art has changed over time. Uh, for example, art and craft have only relatively recently come to be considered separate pursuits, and by the way, not by all members, even of our own society. Not surprisingly, therefore, cultural anthropologists and sociologists see little point to removing art, with capital A, from its cultural context. This outlook is shared though in different ways, both by Marxist and non-Marxist social scientists. For Marxist sociologists, Art in capitalist societies fall, fall uh, art in capitalist society falls prey to the same kind of alienating forces as any other product or activity to which economic value is attached, becoming to an important degree of commodity. For certain non-Marxist sociologists, art in capital A can be viewed as a temporary end product of a complex process of labeling. In this analysis, influential social actors constituting what sociologist Howard Becker has called an art world, assign the term art, with a capital A, to certain categories of works. To the extent that their position is acknowledged as legitimate by others in the society, and in particular that part of the society which makes up their art world, the label will stick. But the analysis does not assume that the label will stick forever. Rather, social meanings are constantly undergoing revision as different groups gain influence, as conditions change, as, for example, shortages of accepted art works for the institutions or collections extend, make it worthwhile for other works to be redefined as art. In that connection, for example, primitive, well, primitive art, I think, is a very good uh, case. In any case, the social definition of what art is for can be understood better when we understand how society defines what art is. The labeling analysis helps us see how, for example, a brass pipe becomes Brankus's bird of flight. 
how a plumbing fixture retrieved by Marcel Duchamp becomes the sculpture of fountain by R. Mutt. How an African votive figure becomes an exhibit in the Michael Rockefeller Wing in the Department of Team of Art, or how recently uh, comic strips have gained the right to government subsidies from the French Ministry of Culture. And some background very briefly on this whole question of the changing meanings of what constitutes art. If we look at ancient buildings, monumental tombs, elaborate decorations, we have to realize that they were not considered primarily art, but basically concrete affirmations of the legitimacy and power of rulers. Ornate objects made of precious metals and stones had similar functions, plus the advantage of portability and convertibility into liquid assets, what Joseph Alsop has labeled treasures as opposed to artworks. Images, whether in mosaic, stone, fresco, oil, or what have you, with religious content, were for reinforcing belief, especially for a largely illiterate population. And the same, of course, can be said for sacred music. With the rise of nation states, hymns incorporating themes of loyalty and patriotism served analogous purposes as did civic buildings when secular rulers became rivals of church and power. The, the creation of images which portrayed specific individuals as opposed to monumental idealized images, not intended to depict a specific likeness, had occurred in Roman statuary, but was revised during the Renaissance. Its revival is usually interpreted as part of the value of individual uniqueness associated with the humanism. Not only did depictions of contemporaries become an important form of work, but even the recreation of hypothetical likenesses of past greats of whom no license had even been made, also became common. Portraiture, initially mostly the domain of the nobility, the higher clergy, and the very wealthy, eventually became a practice for much larger social strata in Europe, especially in the northern part of Europe, but then almost everywhere. Portraits of donors who commissioned for Dallas or other church paintings were often included in the paintings. What these pictures were for then is different from what they are for us today. That is, we are less interested in knowing the name of the donors than the name of the painters. Thus far, it is rare, though not entirely unknown, to find pictures, statues, musical compositions, or buildings referred to as art, as long as the activities that produced them were controlled by craft guilds that were not free of the taints of commercialism, practical rules of thumb, and subservience to the client's whim, even if the client was an exalted personage. Rules governing the content of works intended for religious purposes came not from artists, but from church councils. In only the rarest cases could one speak of the autonomy of art. There was no art for its own sake. Art, undifferentiated from craft, was for its patron or the institution which commissioned it. For this reason, with the founding of the academies, first in France and then in one form or another elsewhere in Europe, the opportunity structure for artists as professionals expanded considerably. Considering the 19th century complaints against them, academies were actually a liberating force for art. In fact, they defined art as an autonomous activity separate from craft, based on a theoretical foundation rather than merely practical methods, and in so doing, raised the status of aspirants who succeeded in gaining access to their education and rewards, both material and symbolic. For all the stodginess that academicism came to represent much later, it provided an aesthetic canon distinct from religious strictures or guild rules. How ironic, then, that the social history of art in the 19th and early 20th century can be summarized as one attack after another on the so-called fossilized academy. Romanticism, naturalism, impressionism, neo-impressionism, folkism, cubism, surrealism, conventional and French attacks, all were movements against the academy. By the second decade of this century, the academy had become no more than one competitor and an increasingly ineffectual one for a vastly expanded clientele this clientele included potential collectors organized by the entrepreneurial dealers who had filled in where the academic canon was violated by artists who could not or would not adhere to the scriptures. The dealers often provided the income and material that artists needed in exchange for a new monopoly on their output. Well, what is art for in those conditions? 
From the early 19th century on, and increasingly to the present, art is for certainly the same ends as in the past. Symbolic glorification of the nation, of religion, of some social prominence, for aesthetic pleasure, though not necessarily any longer for beauty or moral uplift, which were much more common in the early 19th century. But what many observers are struck by is art work as a commodity of trade. Not that dealers and collectors are a new phenomenon. What is new is the expansion of the numbers of collectors, the amount of speculative buying and disposal of art, either by the sale or for tax benefits, by donation to cultural institutions. Furthermore, speculative collecting is not only done by individuals, but by syndicates, by corporations. Dealing is done not only by individual entrepreneurs, gallery owners, but by units of multi multinational corporations. Art then is for providing material or data as well for art historians, cultural sociologists, museum curators and administrators, teachers, impresarios, performers, foundation staffs, and the many occupations ancillary to its creation and dissemination. Art is also a source of cultural capital for individuals with social mobility aspirations, whether they can afford to buy it or are simply be knowledgeable about it. Is art then for something more exalted than these rather mundane functional purposes? Or are these purposes as mundane and as usually implied? That depends again on the social context and on the socially arrived at definitions that emerge from it. On the one hand, art has often been for the support of the status quo, the maintenance of the established regime. This was taken for granted until about the age of what are uh, common here in the age of the democratic revolution. That art should have become autonomous so that artists could view it as a way of expressing their own opinions, interests, ways of seeing the world, or their in inner emotions, uh, is an important deviation from the pre-existing norm. Even at the height of belief in the need for freedom of artistic expression from the 19th century on, there was, however, no consensus among artists as to their proper role in modern society. Some favored a social reforming role for art in order to improve, for example, the condition of the poor. Others favored pure aestheticism. Perhaps the only thing these groups agreed upon was in heaping scorn on the bourgeoisie. But only in the abstract, of course, since many of their patients and collectors came from abstract. There's no doubt that the practice of art is filled with is pervaded by, on the one hand, the likelihood of becoming a commodity, like any other, but at the same time, it retains the aura which even, uh, despite all the benefits of addiction, mechanical reproduction could not erase. A couple of years before his death, Carol Rosenberg wrote about the painter at Reinhardt. Reinhardt, he said, considered the paramount issue of American art to be that of corruption. Not only did he have in mind the behind-the-scenes rigging of reputation and prices, not only the machinations of viewers, collectors, curators, customs, critics, art historians, but worse, artists themselves, and therefore the art they produced, were wallowing in a sea of betrayal. What he meant was that artists were nothing but careerists, and therefore responsible for the state of affairs which existed. That is, their art was meretricious, intended for maximum audience appeal, trendy, gimmicky, and increasingly confused with the life of the artists themselves. According to Reinhardt, unlike the so-called bad old days of the academy when art and life were separated, when fine art and craft were distinct, when a canon demanded conformity to a standard, the post-World War II period was chaos. Anything goes. Anyone can be an artist. There's no more morality than could be a state condition. His solution to this state of affairs was that artists should stop trying to be stars, stop wanting to sell out a show. Instead, they should establish a new academy based on art for its own sake. What he had in mind was an art that was abstract, following no existing knowledge, whether derived from constructivism, abstract expression, and assumes what we live. According to Harold Rosenberg, in fact, the only works which would have passed muster, which reached the standard of austerity, both in content and style, according to Reinhardt's strictures, were his own paintings, black paintings. Yet, in reality, said Rosenberg, Reinhardt had been quite a successful careerist, albeit certain that others were much more successful than he. 
It would seem that at Reinhardt, for not only in terms of art for art's sake, but art for the artist's sake. Yet many agree that the profession of serious artist, as opposed to craftspeople or amateur artists who create naive art, shades over into the, into the contamination of the commercial. This would not be surprising, since most artists, musicians, writers, and so on have to support themselves. In authoritarian regimes, they are faced with a monopolized, limited, but secure opportunity structure, but only at the cost of their autonomy. In Western liberal capitalist democracies, they face a multiple opportunity structure. Educational institutions where they may teach, foundations and government agencies from which they may solicit and sometimes <laughs> receive grants, patrons, individual corporate, who may commission work. But there is also a market composed of gallery owners, dealers, and so on. Furthermore, regardless of what they are paid for their works, they have no control over what happens to them after the works are sold. The fact is, however, that on the average, artists of all kinds make a very poor living. Only a few become the stars of art whom Reinhardt can play. And even those do not gain from the speculation fever that makes paintings a commodity like tulips in the past or postage stamps, stock shares, and futures. Given the materialism which surrounds art, it is surprising that many people, both artists and some of their public, continue to invest art, not invest in art, but invest art with idealistic significance, and that it continues to attract aspirants who are willing to forego the advantages of a stable situation in their lives. For these people, art must offer a kind of fulfillment that little else in the society provides. <coughs> 